I'm Mark Bassingthwaite, the Risk Manager here at ALPS, and welcome to the latest episode of ALPS in Brief, the podcast that comes to you from the historic Florence building in beautiful downtown Missoula, Montana. Today, I thought I'd talk about subscription and legal practices. You know, they've been around for a number of years. Uh, I would not describe them as, you know, just this massive um, rush of lawyers moving into this subscription practice uh, space. But uh, in my experience in, in recent years, there's been a lot more interest in it. And uh, I, I, it seems to me there's there's a, a movement, uh, a growing movement toward this for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is, you know, the, the fallout uh, and, and all the experiences in terms of hybrid work and working from home and things that happened as a result of the pandemic. Um, you know, we're, we're more and more um, open to, as lawyers, more and more open to really saying, you know, can, can we do something different here? Because different has worked in other spaces. Again, going home and, and doing virtual practices for a while and, and all, all these changes that occurred. I also think there's um, a, a recognition that a move toward more client-centric practices uh, is, is, is beneficial uh, financially uh, and, and uh, I think a good thing. And this, in terms of the subscription legal practice model, is one way that I think you can create uh, a, a, a client-centric practice. It's certainly not the only way. I mean, even traditional practices can be far more client-centric. But uh, I like this model, surprisingly. I, I think some folks uh, think, you know, the, a risk guy or a malpractice insurer, uh, speaking as a representative of a malpractice insurer, uh, malpractice insurers may not, uh, may not like these kinds of things for a variety of reasons. Um, and no, I've got to say, I do. I, I really do. We need to understand, however, some of the risks, um, you know, and, and some of the ethical issues, uh, which is really driving my interest in talking about this today. But, uh, you know, that's that's start off by really just sort of defining what a subscription practice is uh, for those of you that uh, uh, really haven't dug into this or, or looked at it a whole lot, you know, and it, it really is what it sounds like. And, and so many of us uh, in today's world uh, are, uh, you know, users or consumers of subscription services of a variety of types. Netflix, uh, as an example, a big, great one. You know, some of these food companies, you know, they, you know, they send you the, all the ingredients to make your meals once a week or once a month, you know, these subscription services. Uh, there's, there's lots of things. So, so the market's very used to this. Um, and as it relates to law, you know, we're really just talking about a lawyer or firm offering clients certain legal services on a recurring monthly fee. It's a subscription. Um, you know, now, what would be included in this subscription? Well, you know, <laughs> all kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's lawyers, we can be a creative bunch. And, and you know, um, I, so I, I can't say, I can't limit it to this, but generally you're going to see some things. You know, there may be um, availability. You know, so for whatever the, the subscription fee is each month, uh, if I'm a prospective uh, subscriber here, you know, I, I might be thinking, okay, you're describing I'm going to get two hours of consultation with you a month. I might get, uh, you know, f a, a two additional hours of a document review of some sort. Uh, I might get um, access to online forms, um, a, a access to you for some drafting. Uh, you know, again, we can say, you know, a document or two and describe what that is or, or a certain number of hours toward uh, drafting. Um, you could get, you could offer, I'm sorry, you know, pre-recorded videos on relevant topics, you know, in other words, some type of library of uh, educational resources. Um, it could be articles and, and just the list just goes on and on. The point is you're trying to create some type of value for the subscriber 
And in, in terms of what it does to you, I mean, think about it. You, you start to have a little bit more um, reliability in terms of a steady income stream. And, and you know, I, I think the model is an excellent model. I also think it, it can work particularly well in something like the nonprofit space. I mean, there are a lot of nonprofits out there that really can't afford to hire uh, full-time in-house counsel or uh, even full-time outside counsel. And then, honestly, they may not need somebody full-time. But the, the, you know, the, the, the legal services they need can be expensive. Well, hey, if you have six, eight, 10 nonprofits all subscribing uh, to your services and you're creating a model to meet the needs of, of, of small nonprofits, you know, now here's, here, here's something I think can work. So, um, yeah, that's, that gives you sort of a quick overview of, get a sense of what uh, subscription practices are all about. The first thing we need to to kind of look at though, or think through, is just identifying, you know, are there ethical issues here, particularly uh, issues that would get in the way, uh, that would make this uh, problematic, uh, to say the least. Uh, now, there certainly are some ethical issues, and we're going to uh, discuss them here, but I, I don't see them as problematic in the sense of preventing anyone from moving in this direction. Uh, but what do we really need to think about? Well, you know, I, I think at the outset, if you have multiple clients, you know, and that's the whole purpose here of subscription services, we have a potential for conflicts. And we, we can talk about how to deal with that. Uh, so the conflict rules are going to be in play. Uh, we also have, you know, the fee issue. You know, is it going to be reasonable? And, and how do we determine what's reasonable? What about advanced payments? You know, what rule 1.15 is going to be in play. Uh, so what do we do with these funds when they come in? Um, and how about, you know, if, how, how do we end this? You know, I could, as a subscriber, say, you know, after a while I'm kind of done. I, 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 I'm just not interested anymore. And you could say, boy, you know, Bassinth Weight uh, has been a subscriber that has just tried to take all kinds of advantage of me and is, is just so high maintenance and uh, just, it, 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 I'm not, you know, getting anything out of this. It's, it's, it, you're just, I'm, a, I'm, I'm costing your money that it's worth. You know, so there, there may be reasons and times where you want to end a subscription. You might find that the whole model has been mispriced and you need to kind of shut this down and, and rethink and, and, and relaunch in a different type of model. So, you know, how do we conclude all of this stuff? Um, you know, so those are some of the the ethical issues, uh, you know, 1.16, declining and terminating representation, uh, 1.15, safekeeping funds, 1.5, you know, setting fees, reasonable fees, and, and the conflict rules. I think those are the biggest ones that we need to deal with. But, okay, so that's start to, to kind of get into this a little bit and figure out. I, I think it's worth starting with 1.5. You know, and, and that's, that's talk about, you know, how, how do we price, um, you know, and a, there's not a standard formula here. I, I think you're going to need to look at the, the specific language of the rules in, in the jurisdiction uh, where you are going to offer these services and are licensed to practice, but, um, and, and figure out what is reasonable, um, you know, but I think it's very doable. Um, you you need to. I don't want to say it. there's there's going to be a difference between okay, if I am on the standard hourly billing model, you know, I don't think pricing and thinking through is, is going to work in the subscription model because, you know, why offer the subscription if, if your billing is going to be the same as a, um, you know, the hourly kind of analysis? What you sort of have to do is sit down and figure out, okay, how much of my time is available? You know, so if I'm going to offer two hours of consultation, a couple hours of contract review, uh, and my availability, you know, so in other words, I may, as the subscriber, may use or not 
use um, these services that, that you're going to uh, offer. But, you know, in terms of the, the two hours every month, I may I just not need that. But I'm also, um, I have availability to you if I do. You know, so you start to factor in, okay, so the, the, the value that you're offering is access to you, some limited services, and perhaps these educational things, you know, whether it's the forums, you know, the, the access to to some type of documents or some DIY kinds of things, whatever it might be. And you kind of have to look at all that and, and, and try to hit a number that works, you know. So it, it, you're going to have... Um, you're going to have to work through that. I, you know, it's I, I, again, I can't give you a standard formula, but I, I, I think it's worth, you know, making, valuing yourself uh, or valuing your subscription based upon access. Uh, and I would try, I think, honestly, to do a little discount here. Um, you know, we need you want you're exchanging if you will the the full service uh, hourly billing kind of cost model to ongoing consistent regular monthly income you know so um, it it has to be finan it has to make financial sense to me as a subscriber you know so um, there're just some things to think about. I, I can't give you the magic number here again, a magic formula. Uh, I've seen some situations where you know it might be a hundred, two hundred dollars a month, uh, and in other situations, I, I've seen lawyers charging you know several thousand, five, eight thousand a month um, for services. But uh, what the subscribers are getting for that five to eight thousand uh, is is really some some pretty significant uh, work and but it's still going to be less expensive to the subscriber than and typically these are going to be businesses at, at this tier uh, I think in most situations but the, the the business would is still saving money by going on this subscription practice so um, it, it, you need to find that magic number that's sort of a win-win for both of you. The more interesting question is, 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 you know, ethically the safekeeping of funds, you know, when, when, in other words, if you start to get a subscriber and these monthly fees are coming in, you know, what, what do you do with them? Do they need to be put in a trust account? Uh, do they need, to, can they be earned upon receipt? Uh, can you make them non-refundable? Um, you know, there are a lot of ideas out there and, and you certainly want to, you know, get the steady income and make it easy for you and easy for, for uh, your subscribers. It's, the problem here is the ethical rules really don't address specifically this model. Um, the, the one thing, that I, and again, you're always going to have to check your local jurisdiction in terms of the, the, the RPCs here. Um, I would strongly advise never to use words like non-refundable. Uh, in I, I don't care what your model is. To me, it's more of an issue, are we going to put it in trust uh, or not? And I, I think... I sort of like this hybrid approach, you know, I like, I would argue that the funds that you charge monthly are earned upon receipt because it is, there's this retainer component to it. It's not a true retainer, you know, because a true retainer is just a, a, you know, a client paying you to be available. And then any work that they do, that they ask you to do subsequent to putting you on retainer, um, you charge whatever your rates are, you know, so a true retainer is solely for availability. And that, that's kind of what we have here. But, you know, it's a hybrid thing because in addition to getting access to you, whether I use it or not, in a lot of these situations, I'm going to have access to this library, to these other resources on day one. And so if you describe, you know, what I get as a subscriber for the um, subscription, 
in a way, you know, Clue is saying, you get access to me, you get, uh, or I should say, I get access to you, uh, I get access to the this library of resources uh, or, or whatever other perks are out there on the side. Um, and, um, you know, you have access to me on day one and you have access to the library on day one. Well, I would consider that earned upon receipt. Now, there's still could be some arguments that, eh, you know, um, ethically some jurisdictions may not like that. Well, I, I see two workarounds with that. The first would be, you know, you can charge at the end of the month. So then it's earned upon receipt because they got their money for the first, you know, they got their what they are paying for, you know, by the end of the month, they've had their month of, of access. Um, some say, well, I'm giving away a month for free. Well, yeah, I, I get that. Um, you could take the payment up front, put it in trust, and then take it out of trust at the end of each month. Um, you might take the first payment only and keep it in trust. And then, you know, so they pay at the start, um, you know, on day one they pay, you just hold that in trust. And then at the end of each uh, month or at the first of every next month, you know, the, you, you, that keeps moving into your account and you sort of just keep that first payment out there, I guess, for a while. Because I, I don't want to keep the hassle of, you know, moving money twice every month. I sort of maybe let something sit, but again, you'd have to, you know, you check with your, your local uh, ethics um, council in, in whatever jurisdiction, you know, to, to, to again, talk through that. But uh, I, I think there's a strong argument for, uh, for having it earned upon receipt if it is described like this um, in terms of clearly identifying what you get. Uh, so, okay. The, um, there are some other ethical issues that we can talk about. Um, but before I sort of, I, instead of hitting them directly, I, I first want to let you know that there's a, an interesting ethics opinion that came out of Maryland. And uh, it happens, if you're interested in this opinion, it, it, it's it's docket number 2020-01, so issued in January of 2020, um, and it, it's worth taking a look at. But it's 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 a, you know, it's the only opinion I'm aware of that that really sort of dug into to subscription practices and, and tried to address uh, some of these issues. And I think the advice set forth in that opinion is, is uh, well worth looking at. So I'm going to share sort of the key uh, things that clients must be made aware of or potential subscribers must be made aware of before they sign on the dotted line. Okay. Um, and I, I I, I'm sharing this because I think this addresses reasonably well the issues that, that arise um, ethically. So the, the, there are nine items that this opinion talks about. The first, the specific services to be provided in exchange for the subscription fee must be disclosed and any limitations on the client's use of these services within a particular service period. You know, so we need to set forth that information in an agreement. The client or a potential subscriber here, I keep saying client, uh, needs to understand the method by which a subscribing client may request such services and the time frame within which such services are to be provided. Is this monthly? Is this quarterly? Uh, that kind of thing. Okay. The benefits of a subscription which would reserve your availability for representation, but which would also compensate you for providing the, speci the specified services upon request and without additional charge. So, you know, really saying, for, what do I get for my subscription fee? You know, you need to detail that. The risks associated with this form of representation. Now, and they go on to say, it, it may be hard to predict all the risks associated, but you, you have to inform them of some minimum type of things, conflicts of interest, as an example, and other legal issues may later arise, which could preclude you from rendering some or all of the services. You know, and, and conflicts, so, you know, let's talk about that. You know, you can't represent 
two clients that are directly adverse. You know, an example uh, might be, you know, you represent some corporations and, uh, you know, you, you issue a, you, you, you help register a trademark for, for one of the companies. And then later on, uh, one of the other companies, it's a client, a subscriber, asks you to register a competing mark. Well, you, you can't do that. Okay, so, you know, we can describe what happens here. If a conflict arises, you know, perhaps um, you disclose that you will refer uh, where able, um, you know, the, the uh, client, the, the second client to, to another uh, attorney to handle certain specific matters. Um, you know, depending what's going on, you may not be able to stay with the second client at all. But if we, and, and so you need to withdraw entirely and end that subscription. You know, so, you know, it, it's the details, the specifics are going to matter here in terms of what's creating the conflict and how you can resolve it. But I think it is resolvable. And we can get around, if you will, the hot potato drop, you know, where you particularly when you're having joint representation, um, you know, we, that's where it comes up most in terms of hot potato drop. You know, if, you, if you're out for one, you're out for all. Well, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case when we're talking about situations like this because we are getting we're disclosing up front. We're sort of it's, view it as informed consent. This is one of the ramifications. There may be situations where you know that you can't control as because you know clients self-subscribe, and uh, if you identify down the road uh, a conflict, they agree in advance that they understand. You, you may refer or you may have to withdraw. Uh, so I, I view this as informed consent. And, and so um, there are different approaches here in terms of how you uh, describe this and, and what clients are going to be asked to, to waive. But, um, you know, again, practice areas, et cetera, are going to dictate some of this. But I, I think it's doable. I really do. Uh, some other things that uh, the Maryland opinion talked about. Uh, you need to describe situations in which additional charges would apply for any of the services listed and whether additional retainer agreements would be required for more extensive work. The, the way I see that is, and, and I see this as, as a, a beneficial thing to do up front. Um, you know, so I'm a subscriber and I, I see that I get, you know, these uh, two hours of consultations or, uh, you know, last minute touch base if needed. Uh, I get contract review, document review, whatever it might be. But uh, I know that there are going to be times where I'm going to need more work, that that's, gonna, that's not going to be enough. And so you should describe and detail. These are the limitations. This is specifically what you get and what you don't get for the subscription price, the subscription fee. If you need additional services along these lines, and, and you know, and you, you're going to know what most clients are going to need. Um, you know, here is the list. If you need additional hours, if you need additional documents drafted, whatever it might be, um, you know, here are the rates. And I would suggest, you know, sort of offering and letting people know so they can see some of the benefits. In other words, um, here's the friend and family slash subscriber discount. You know, our, our subscribers get that that special price. You know, if you weren't a subscriber, having this uh, service provided by me would normally cost you this. And it's another way to demonstrate value add of the subscription. So I, I think there's real value in doing that um, to help both in the sales piece, but also in the risk management piece, you know, so that we don't get into these arguments about, well, I thought I'd get more, you know, let's just make it very clear. So the subscriber can make an informed decision about whether or not to, to even do this. Um, since these fees, so going back to what the Maryland Bar uh, 
is recommending uh, additional things, uh, setting forth that since these fees will be earned irrespective of whether the client actually requests such service, you want to advise subscribers that the plan may not work to their advantage if they do not use available services, at least on a somewhat regular basis. You know, help them understand the risks, the benefits, the pros and cons, okay? And then you should also describe the circumstances under which subscription fees will be refunded to the client, including the provision that fees would, at a minimum, be refunded if the attorney fails, if, if you fail to render some or all of the services requested, okay? Um, I would couple that with notices of the client's right to cancel the subscription at any time subject to the refund policy that you come up with. Okay? Um, you know, so let's talk about that a little bit. If some You will see in some models, you know, and I'm just making numbers up here obviously, but let's that, say it's a, you know, the subscription is $100 a month. Um, and uh, if you if if I sign up for a year, um, I'll, you know my subscription is going to be discounted even more, and maybe it'll cost me a thousand dollars for the year, as opposed to twelve hundred dollars, right? And I'm in for six months, and then I just I'm not using this in the way I thought, uh, or you decide passing points you're using it way way too much, <laughs> and and this subscription is going to be terminated uh, before the year's out, you know. So you haven't earned the full year, right? I've only been in six months, so you know you would want to refund half because I didn't get the benefit of the full year subscription. So that's why, you know, as an example of, of why I don't like these um, non-refundable kinds of things, because bars are very consistent on this one. If you haven't earned it, you can't keep it. And even calling it non-refundable doesn't change that. So um, it's just an example of, of the, you know, just what we need to think through. Um, and then, you know, if you're going to um, deposit into your trust account, uh, I'm sorry, into your operating account, in other words, treating the subscription fee at the beginning of the month as fully earned upon payment, um, you know, if that is uh, permissible in your jurisdictions, some jurisdictions it, it should be, and in others it's not going to be because it's not going to be viewed as earned. They don't see things quite the way I and a few others do. Uh, but, you know, but we just disclose what's going to happen to the fund, you know, that the fees will be deposited into your operating account upon receipt, subject, of course, to a refund of the entire subscription fee if you're not available or unable to provide the specified services. Um, you know, I could see, well, what would that, could be anything. Um, you have, you get infected with ransomware and you're out for a while and you couldn't follow through on any of this stuff. Um, you, you have an unforeseen, um, illness of some sort. I mean, there, there, life happens, in other words, and there can be times where, where you can't follow through. But, you know, again, you're just disclosing. You're being very uh, direct and upfront, uh, transparent. Uh, that's a word of the day, isn't it? Um, you know, about the money situation here. So um, I, I like that opinion because it really does give us a sense of, of how to navigate these waters. Um, what it doesn't really get into a great deal, um, you know, other than to say the client has a right to cancel the subscription, um, I, I think it's also worth setting forth that you can cancel the script, subscription. Um, you might talk about why, you know, whether the difficulties with a particular client, you're changing the focus of your practice, you might even need to reevaluate the terms, you know, but you, you, I think it's important to let people know that you also, like they, have a right to cancel. You have a right to cancel too, and that's talk about what happens there. Um, and particularly, again, with the money, but, uh, and my suspicion is, uh, you know, the, the same um, policy, a refund policy, et cetera, is, is, is going to be in play regardless of who terminates. But, um, 
you know, I, I, I think it's worth addressing because it, it's too easy to, to, to focus on all the things that might happen with a client and taking care and making sure they're fully informed, but then not thinking about, well, wait, <laughs> what happens if I don't like this either? Uh, or, you know, speaking as, as on the lawyer side of this. So that's sort of the, the gist of... Uh, subscription practices and uh, some of the ethical concerns and, and how I might um, think through the ethical issues and resolve them. I, I really do find the, the Maryland opinion helpful. Um, and I, I just want to keep underscoring because I, I think it's a worthwhile process to go through in advance to, to really sit down and think through these issues and write you know, a, a, an agreement that really discloses all of these things. It helps us as lawyers get a, get a, a handle on really what are we doing, what are we offering, how, you know, and, and it just, I, I think it's also then just going to prevent disagreements and misunderstandings, uh, per, perhaps is a better word, from arising with uh, subscribers down the road. The, the, the one other little thing we could talk about briefly, and my apologies here, I wish I could give you a black and white answer, a very clear answer, and I can't, but I can give you something to think about. And the interesting issue here is, is malpractice coverage going to be in play with a subscription practice? And the answer isn't as clear as I'd like it to be or I would hope it would be. I think in general, yes, the when you are in an attorney-client relationship, which you would be, but that's make sure that your subscription model is structured that way, um, you know, because they have time with you, availability and all that. Um, you know, you are going to be delivering professional services using your, your you know, the, the skill set that you have as a lawyer um, to these clients, and they are all clients of your practice. So the subscription practice has to be part of, if, if you know, sometimes it's all, and that's okay, uh, but more often it tends to be part of a practice, but, you know, don't break this off into a separate company. I mean, you can, and, and we can talk about that in a minute, but if you want your malpractice policy that you have with your firm, you know, these subscribers need to be clients of the firm and they can be subscription practice clients, you know. Uh, so I, I think if we've got all that, I, I think we're pretty good. Here's the rub. You know, you need to look at sort of uh, the definition of professional services and is offering as an example, um, do-it-yourself forms that any subscriber can just come in and pick and use on their own without any involvement, review, advice from you about, you know, is this fit the need or not, you know. Some are going to argue that's not the practice of law, that's not professional services, and policies aren't going to respond. Um, you know, that's more of exposure, you sort of a publisher's uh, exposure, something along those lines. You know, you're just, you're making um, written materials available and, and, and that's, that's, you know, use your own risk kind of stuff. Um, so there's not going to be a bright line on that one. In my mind, there's a bit of a difference between, you know, offering some forms, but um, advising clients to meet with you for a, even if it's just a 15 minute discussion to make sure that this form accurately addresses the the legal concern the client is hoping the form will will resolve uh, take care of so um, that to me is is very much down the middle of the road of practicing law, you know, and, and, and um, if it's just freestanding forms and 
they may not even get access. So I'm really trying to draw a line here that's a little clearer on explaining or demonstrating the risk. But if, if, if we have just this site where solely forms are made available and that's all they get for their subscription and they can just get in and have access and you're never really involved. You can say, well, I could be involved and here's the, that the subscribers discount for legal services, but the subscription doesn't include that at all, you know? Um, and so, as a subscriber, I start using these forms. I never get involved with you, and and uh, I I sue you at some point because I don't know what I'm doing with these forms. I made all kinds of mistakes. Um, uh, you know that uh, malpractice policy isn't going to come into play there. Um, now you certainly can insure for that type of risk, and it's probably easier in a situation like this to split things out and, and have sort of a separate company that is just doing this exclusive DIY model without any inter attorney involvement. Um, you know, there you, you can get insurance on both sides, and and I think be pretty good, or you know, both pieces of that. But it's, it's when we start to blend this in various ways or we can get a little muddy. The best I can do is to say, as, as you work through looking at the model and, and uh, should you want to go in this direction, you know, reach out to your carrier and, and have some discussions and, and look at policy language and try to identify and work through any coverage issues that, that might come up. I just hate to see you run with an assumption that because you know this is done under the banner of a law firm that coverage is automatically there you know lawyers are not insured for everything they do uh, under the banner of a law firm you know look at exclusions and, and policies financial advice is an example um, obligations that arise under contract um, there's all kinds of things that can come up um, you know uh, wrongful disbursement of funds, uh, you know, that's property loss. It's, that's not a professional negligence problem. Uh, you know, so there are all kinds of things. And this is just another example of something that, that isn't necessarily covered. I just don't want to see you run with an assumption. So we've been at it here far longer than I thought we would. I hope you found something of value with this uh, this podcast and uh, as always if you have questions concerns on this or or any other topic please do not hesitate to reach out my email address is mbass b a s s at alpsinsurance one word dot com mbass at alpsinsurance dot com hey folks it's been a, been a pleasure <laughs> have a good one bye bye <laughs>